Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Join Us Today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Lemleru on DTT because we're free to wear on DSTV channel 12421 uh, and Go TV channel 125. We are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, majority MPs considering summoning parliament for an emergency setting to uh, complete with the uh, business of the House as the Speaker yesterday adjourned Parliament indefinitely. In the light of this process, the House is unable to continue to consider the nominations of His Excellency the President. We have details of the government business on hold as the legislature and executive go on a collision course after chaotic end to the first meeting of the fourth session of the eighth parliament. Also this afternoon, Ghana Education Service instructs head teachers to keep schools open despite the industrial action by teachers. Yes, I will be very surprised, very much surprised if Fairway tells everybody that they are unaware about Plus, the Ashanti Regional Security Council to provide support for protecting power transmission sites. We will bring you details shortly. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and X Spaces at Joy News on TV. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Please do stay for details. <music> Choosing us this afternoon after an abrupt and chaotic indefinite adjournment of parliament, the majority side says it is seriously considering sermon in parliament for an emergency sitting of parliament to consider some key government business, tax waivers, loans and ministerial nominees, all government business were the biggest casualties as the role of the anti-LGBTQ bill led Speaker Alban Bagby to adjourn the House without allowing the House to consider them. It will be recalled that the President rejected attempts by Parliament to serve President Ekofuado with copies of the anti-LGBTQ bill for his assent. The presidency explains this is because of cases pending before the Supreme Court. Well, following the lead of President Speaker Alban Bagbin has also decided that Parliament will not consider President Ekofuado's ministerial nominees because of an injunction application filed by an MP. In the light of this process, the House is unable to continue to consider the nominations of His Excellency the President. <laughs> to use the language of the Attorney General and Minister for Justice, quote, in the spirit of upholding the rule of law, unquote, until, until after the determination of the application for interlocutory injunction by the Supreme Court. Honorable members, this is the precedent that is being set by His Excellency the President for all Ghanaians to follow. So any matter that comes before Parliament, any Ghanaian can issue a writ and follow it with an application for injunction. And that is enough to injunct Parliament from proceeding with the consideration of the business in the House. The leaders of both the minority and majority are divided over its raging controversy. The majority leader, Dr. Kassiela Tofosin, says the Speaker is right in his determination and may initiate an impeachment proceeding against the President. But the majority leader, Alexander Fenyo Marking, argues the NDC MPs are in bed with the Speaker to frustrate government business. The Constitution of Ghana spells out in plain language, when the President of the Republic of Ghana must do, when 
Parliament passes a bill and present to His Excellency the President. The President must assent to the bill or must refuse to assent to the bill when it is presented to him as the President of the Republic. These are the only options. And in this case, there is no middle ground at all per the, constitu per, per the constitutional imperative. Ladies and gentlemen, let me also say that in the instance case of the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill 2024, President Akufuado has taken a strange and alien position, which is unknown to the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Given that Parliament has been injuncted in a matter of the President's nominee for the position of ministers and deputy ministers, it is obvious that this Honorable House is also unable and cannot approve those ministerial nominees His Excellency the President has also presented to Parliament. Yeah. 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 At this point, the President may have to be innovative, dynamic, and think out of the box by downsizing the size of his government. Let me say that merely piling on numbers by way of appointing ministers and deputy ministers does not signal to the people of Ghana that the president understand the seriousness of the mess that he and his government has created in our country. Mr. Speaker said that Mr. President was undermining democracy and that he should have resorted to the constitution in making certain communications to the House. We in the majority beg to disagree on the position taken by him. If you carefully read the letter that was sent to Parliament, Mr. President limited himself to the processes before the court. And the fact that Parliament itself, through an affidavit, had joined issues. Parliament has filed an affidavit in opposition, and it's in court. In fact, Parliament is a party to the suit. So for us, we do not see how this would have to affect the proceedings of Parliament. In any event, Mr. Speaker has always deferred to the leadership of the House to guide him in the conduct of business. This morning, the leadership of the House sat together to discuss the various items to be taken. We have finished some of them. There were some that we were supposed to take, and we're told that Mr. Speaker would have to take the chair. It's very disappointing that after Mr. Speaker had made known his own views about the letter sent from the presidency to the clerk, he adjourned the House Senate year without giving room for the leadership of the House to even comment. Meanwhile, Dean of the UPSA Law School, Professor Kofi Avocci, says the clerk to Parliament can go ahead and submit the bill to the President for him to state reasons why he cannot ascend as captured in the 1992 Constitution. He spoke on PM Express. So I think at this stage, it's important for cool heads to prevail. It is important for the principles of checks and balances to be activated. And a key aspect of the principles of checks and balances as enunciated in the Constitution is the idea of collaboration. So I do expect that the key heads of institutions, i.e. the Speaker of Parliament and His Excellency the President of the Republic, I do expect that there should be some back-channel conversations already ongoing. Um, it is important that the two speak and the two are at idem or on the same page about this. Let's be clear. The exercise is not one of a confrontation between Parliament and the Executive. Parliament is performing its legitimate business of lawmaking. The Executive is asserting its legitimate influence of deciding whether or not to sign the bill. Um, we may have issues with the letter, people may put interpretations, but anyone is entitled to, as it were, uh, proper ideas or proper su suggestions or 
um, you know, give out give out opinions on particular things. So I would want to treat the letter purely as an opinion, as an opinion written from the office of the president to parliament. Parliament can decide to proceed by sending the law. It is up to the executive to decide not to sign the law because of its interpretation. Now, my understanding is that the letter is probably trying to interpret the law that in the circumstances of the pendency of the injunction, if the bill is brought to the office of the president, this is going to be the reaction. But the most important thing is all the organs are performing their respective legitimate functions and duties. Problem about the character of injunctions and the principles of injunctions under Ghanaian law is that anybody at all can freeze anything by merely bringing an application to court. So whether or not the application is frivolous, whether or not the application is meritorious, before the court ever gets to hear it, the period within which the, the injunction has been pending before court is supposed to be a frozen moment. The Ghana Education Service has directed regional and district education directors to ensure head teachers keep schools open after the three teacher unions declared an indefinite strike yesterday over their conditions of service. In a statement released by the GS, the service urged parents not to panic, assuring them that management is working to resolve the situation. Excerpts of that statement uh, reads, management of the Ghana Education Service has read from the media that three teacher unions in the pre tertiary education sector have declared withdrawal of their services effective Wednesday, uh, March 20. It goes on to say heads of public kindergarten and primary schools as well as junior and senior high schools have been directed through the regional and district directors to mobilize their management teams to ensure the safety and well-being of all students in school. Now, meanwhile, parents are advised to remain calm and be assured that management is closely monitoring the situation and will advise on the way forward accordingly. Regional and district directors have further been directed to ensure heads keep schools open and closely supervise all children who report to school pending further directives from management of GS. Well, prior to that statement by the Ghana Education Service, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission has been disputing the accusation by the three teacher unions that there has been delays in negotiations of collective agreement. The commission is expected to meet the unions and other stakeholders today. Let me share excerpts of that statement issued by the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. It says the FWSC has cited a news item by the media outlets where three teacher unions, NAT, Nagwat, and CCT have declared an indefinite nationwide strike. The teacher unions are concerned about the delay in negotiations of the conditions of service. Well, Fair Wages and Salaries Commission wishes to categorically state that there has not been any delay in the negotiations. We, however, wish to respond to the concerns raised by the teacher unions as follows. At the meeting held with the teacher unions on January 20, the government team was able to reach an agreement with the teacher unions on 10 out of the 16 items submitted for negotiations. Fair Wages and Salaries Commission indicated that there was a need to secure further mandate from the Ministry of Finance on the outstanding items in order to conclude negotiations with the teacher unions to which they agreed. And three, subsequently, uh, Fair Wages and Salaries Commission extended an invitation to teacher unions on March 19 meet, uh, for a meeting on Thursday, March 21 at 10 a.m. to continue and possibly conclude the negotiations. We went further to contact some leaders of the teacher unions as part of preparation towards the meeting on Thursday. There was no indication whatsoever of their intention not to be available for further engagement. Meanwhile, Head of Compensation at NAT and Vice President of NAGWA, Jacob Anaba, have uh, rebuted uh, most of the claims uh, made by the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, adding they will reconvene with their members and decide on whether to honour the Salaries Commission's invitation to continue the negotiations or otherwise they spoke to Kenneth J.C. I will be very surprised, very much surprised if Fair Wages tells everybody that 
they are unaware about this action. Because before we arrive at this decision, as of um, February 29, we have served a written notice to our employer. We copied the National Labor Commission and fair wages as well. So I'll be much surprised if they tell you they are not aware. So those 10 items he's talking about, those were distinct items already. They were just a procedural item. The most pressing ones are those that we haven't finished and have not touched. So those are existing ones already. Mm. And are you going to honor the invitation to come to the, the negotiation table once again? We just received the invitation. I received mine this morning. So leadership will meet and take a decision. And don't forget that we, let, we, uh, we identified five items. Okay. okay. The fair wages one is just one of them. There are four items that we have not heard anything about yet. Um, unfortunately, I did not receive that invitation. Uh, my boss did, but he indicated that he received the invitation late that evening through uh, social media communication. And already we had <laughs> started our decision uh, to, to, to declare the strike. We have written to our employer through the Director General. We are written to the National Labor Commission and copy the uh, Fair Wages and uh, Salary Commission. So already the addition was in motion to call the strike the next day. And that is what, what happened. Well, the Ministry of Education's Public Relations Officer, Kwesi Kwarten, says his outfit agrees with the GES's instruction directing district and regional education directorates to keep the schools open. Kwesi Kwarten asks that the Education Ministry will be present at the meeting and will be hoping the stakeholders come to a mutual conclusion. Wages and Salaries Commission and even the uh, teacher unions, uh, for that matter, the striking teacher unions, and uh, tentatively, we scheduled Friday to meet. It is true, apparently, uh, Fair Wages has sent letters of invitation to the teacher unions, but according to them, the understanding is that it's on short notice. So hopefully by Friday, all stakeholders should be uh, uh, ready and, and have all discussions with the hope of resolving this impasse. Right, and I want to find out from you if the ministry sides with the Ghana Education Services statement instructing district and regional education directorates to keep the schools open despite the teacher unions being on strike. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the schools, even though, I mean, we, we work together with the teachers, the schools uh, obviously are independent institutions, and particularly when even times like this, a lot of them are within the, the, the boarding schools and will still be around. So certainly there have to be some demonstration of leadership and some management or ultimately. It is the, uh, for this reason that we've directed that, of course, through Ghana Education Service, that temporarily there should be some management structures and arrangement within the schools, even ahead of uh, our meetings to, to find lasting resolution to the concerns that has been raised. The teacher unions largely are, are employees. And of course, the, the strike action affects us directly and our students. And so this time it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a government affair. And so all parties, including Ministry of Finance, Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Employment, Education, all of us are going to be present in that meeting. But of course, the, the sole aim is to be able to make sure that we are able to have a very fruitful discussion and get our teachers back to the classroom. Mr. Kwating, SPRO of the Education Ministry. Two other stories, the Electricity Company of Ghana is counting on the collaboration of the Ashanti Regional Security Council to offer security protection of its electrical transmission sites across the region. This follows the collapse of at least eight towers as a result of stolen metal bolts 
and not holding the pylons. A damage assessment carried out on the GISO power transmission sites indicates it will take about 30 days for the towers to be re-erected. Several communities, including Bekwai, Abankru, Kumewu, Antwakrum, Mansung Kwanta, and Ejoso, have been plunged into total blackout as a result of the falling electricity pylons. The electricity company of Ghana said some unidentified persons vandalized the towers to remove the bolts and nuts of about eight high tension towers stationed on some six kilometers of their Ejoso transmission site. The towers fell, cutting electricity supply to communities around the area. Rapid efforts of technicians and engineers at the electricity company of Ghana are being employed to restore power to some of the communities. Engineer Collins Manu is a public relations officer for the Ashanti sub transmission of the electricity company. Company of Ghana. For now, our focus is on getting those who are being affected on supply. And that is what we've been doing since yesterday. We, there was one of the towers which was tilted towards another circuit, or that's another tower line which was not affected. And our team was here yesterday to remove that tower line from the circuit that was okay. And they are still there, as we can see behind me that they are trying to reinstate all the conductors that are falling on that good tower line mm. so that we can restore all customers who have been affected on supply by close of day. Then uh, you will do the reinstatement work of the, the falling ones. And the conductor who came to do the assessment assured us that within 30 days that can be done. Over $1.2 million is needed to reinstate all failed ECG high tension towers. An inspection led by the Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osei Mensa and officers of ECG was carried out on the site to ascertain the magnitude of damage and repairs. Simon Osei Mensa says experts are working assiduously to rectify the situation. Meanwhile, he is admonishing the ECG to liaise with the Ashanti Regional Security Council to expand protection for the transmission sites. Already we are battling with instability of power. So if you should have this additional trouble, uh, it's going to affect us a lot. When we see people whose attitude, whose behavior around some of these installations are questionable, they should quickly report them to the security agencies so that action could be taken. Also, my advice to ECG, once they've seen us, I think they should make conscious efforts to monitor all the pylons. They should go and inspect all the pylons. It's possible this might not be the only one, so that if we have such situations, they could be rectified as soon as possible. Uh, ECG, you have to collaborate with the Regional Security Council so that some of these challenges could, could be prevented. Reporting for Joy News, my name is Clinton Yeboah. The power distributor is worried about various forms of power theft, including illegal connections, which tend to dent the image of ECG in seeking to become the most reliable power distributor in the country. As part of its mobilization driver course, the Shanti region, the ECG is warning the general public to desist from such acts. The electricity company of Ghana has expressed worry over the blatant scale of power theft identified in major parts of the country. These acts have contributed to major commercial losses for the company. Ashanti West ECG PR Benjamin Obinyanchi is worried about the situation. He has cautioned perpetrators against such acts. Well, we want the general public to know that the meter belongs to ECG, not the customer. That is why when you check the meter, it is written the property of electricity company of Ghana. So customers who think the meters belong to them, no, please, the meter belongs to ECG. So at this point, we are cautioning our customers who have been engaging in illegal transfer of meter. Meters in your premises are not transferable. You can't transfer, let's say you are staying at Tunzu, you are moving towards Swami. So you want to transfer meter from Atunzu to Swami. No, that is illegal. Anytime we, we get someone, we'll surcharge you for it to pay the penalty or even hand over to the authorities. Then again, customers that you have your service cable, that's the cable from the low voltage pole to your premises. Once they are solely go to the police for a police extract and then come to the ACO for you to have a discussion. But as a company, we are embarking on a robust program to improve our meter situation in the region. Benjamin Entry says the repercussions are unbearable. It's unbearable for ECG in the sense that when a meter is 
transferred, you realize that all the meters have dual codes. So the dual codes are what we use to identify the meter. So once we are on our map and then we are going, we say, oh, this meter is at a tool. So once we get there, the meter is nowhere to be found. So definitely, if it's even a bill we are going to give to that customer, we don't know where the person is. If we are doing our monitoring to check the integrity of the meter, we wouldn't know where the meter is, where the person has moved the meter. So it normally affects our financial health as well, because that person can move from here and go here, and then the person will consume power on our blind side. Meanwhile, Tetra Tech and USAID have supported the Ashanti Regional Gender and Social Inclusion Unit of the ECG with a drop-in daycare center to help working mothers. Kumo McCarthy is change management coach at USAID. She indicated the need for a well-equipped unit for the ECG's gender and social inclusion unit. ECG, since 2018, right? You, you've been, you've embarked on this journey since 2018, right? Your journey has intensified and you have made remarkable progress. In a short space of time, honestly, you need to really give yourself a hand of applause. You are aligning your processes, which says it is commitment. When you have a policy, that is an indication that your management team is committed to the process. Ashanti Regional West Manager Max Dapa commended USAID and Tetra Tech for the initiative. My view that the whole idea of a drop-in daycare centre is laudable. And I suggest that it's extended to the other regions of uh, ECG. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let me take the opportunity to pay tribute to the Employees Relations Division of the HR Directorate of ECG for conceiving the idea and pushing for its implementation. For Joe News, Nana Bwachidang Kwayatom, Kumasi. Let's stay in the Ashanti region because the Akonfa Noche Teaching Hospital is aiming at committing funds to research and upgrading its facilities to address a growing number of stroke and kidney cases. Management intends to tackle possible deaths from strokes and kidney failures by investing in the adaptation of operational research alongside the expansion and refurbishment of the hospital's dialysis center. Anna Boachi Yadom has more from the Confanochi Teaching Hospital end of year performance review meeting in Kumase. The Confanochi Teaching Hospital hopes to enhance the quality of care provided to patients and ultimately save lives with novel services. Management therefore plans to invest in operational research to help identify effective ways for stroke prevention and management, leading to improved patient outcomes and reduced healthcare costs. Chief Executive of the hospital, Professor Ochiri Ade Mensah, says aside from the introduction of thrombolysis services, the hospital will invest in research and innovation to save patients from possible stroke deaths. He was speaking at the hospital's 2023 end-of-year performance review conference in Kumasi. Management with the support of the board will this year continue to invest in the adoption of innovations and conduct of operational research as part of the overall strategy to optimize the delivery of tertiary healthcare services at the hospital. Management's commitment in this direction can be seen from the historic introduction of thrombolysis services as part of routine stroke care at the hospital. This novel service is aimed at saving patients brought to the hospital in time from disabilities and possible death from strokes. Steps will also be taken to strengthen the corporate and special services unit during the year to allow for busy patients and other corporate executives the opportunity to assess specialist services at the hospital at their convenience. Professor Ade Mensa also spoke about achieving major improvement in dialysis services with three new machines. The hospital expects a major improvement in its dialysis services soon, when the three new machines with a six-month supply of consumables procured at close to 1.6 million Ghana cities are delivered next month. Similarly, Surgical and physiotherapy services are also primed to receive a major boost with the completion of the renovation of the main theater and the physiotherapy center at a combined cost of around 3 million Ghana cities.
The Konfanochi Teaching Hospital is resolved to create an ecosystem that engenders regular appraisal of strategies and programs for the purpose of optimizing specialist healthcare services. Pro Vice Chancellor of KNUST Professor Ellis Ousudapo was guest speaker at the conference. The success of a teaching hospital is not solely contingent upon bricks and mortar. It requires a concerted effort from a diverse array of stakeholders spanning academia, government, industry, healthcare institutions, and the broader community that includes our stakeholder, the client. Each stakeholder brings unique expertise, resources, and perspectives to the table, all of which are essential for the realization of our shared vision. For Joy News, Nana Bwache Dankui Adom, Kumasi. We're still live on Joy News today. We are coming to you live from our studios in Kokom Lemli on DTT because we're free to wear. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll bring you the very latest coming from the world of business. Hi, welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Leading brand under Unilever Ghana Pepsodent has reaffirmed its commitment to increase proper oral health care among citizens from a younger age. To this end, Pepsodent has joined some basic students in Accra to mark this year's Oral Health Day, with, which seeks to create awareness of oral health and prevention of diseases. Here's more. PEP student is aiming at innovative activities to reduce the concerns of oral health, which has been one of the major challenges for the younger generations. In Ghana, studies show that about 13% of middle school children suffer from dental cavities. Category manager for oral care at Unilever, Vera Buedu, has been speaking about some initiatives like the tele-dentistry. We started this in October 2023, and what we realized is that a lot of Ghanaians had a lot of questions. A lot of questions around um, cavities, mouth odor, simple, simple questions like you saw being asked over here. You can quickly call a dentist and verify whether to use a soft toothbrush, a soft bristle toothbrush, or a hard bristle toothbrush. And so far, engagement already, we've had across the two platforms about 3,000 Ghanaians accessing this platform on a monthly basis and we continue to do it. Um, our next step for us is just to see how we can bring in more languages. Currently our dentists can speak um, just English and Cree and the next phase for, um, for it is to expand into more languages. We are looking to at least a minimum of four languages um, in Ghana. So we are getting the dentists with the support of the GDA to help us um, in that case. She has therefore been speaking about the importance of the celebration and why Unilever is supporting the initiative. So for World Oral Health Day, um, it's a day which we have set aside, um, not just for us in PEP students or Unilever, it's a day which was um, started off by the World Dental Federation, FDI, since 2007. On that particular day, this is today, 20th of March, we set aside to talk about, um, advocate about oral hygiene, the issues around it, um, the preventive mechanics we can, we can do, advice just to make people aware of the importance of oral hygiene as part of total health for an individual. And that's why we have set aside this day. So on this day, you notice the people who came to speak. It's not just Unilever PEP students. You have people um, beyond Unilever. You have people from the Ghana Dental Association also taking part. You have people from government institutions. The GES is a key partner for us because we are talking to kids. They also come and then we invite parents, students. Everybody needs to be part of this celebration so that they'll be aware of the issues, matters arising around oral hygiene, issues, ways to prevent it, and the solutions which are being put forward in there. Unilever believes that, despite the natural occurrence of tooth loss during childhood, the prevalence of oral pain related to cavities and tooth decay is alarming and avoidable. All right, and that's it for this segment. Sports is up next. Now to bring you sports on Joy News today with me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah Ghana's uh, 
200 meters athletes Joseph Paula Moa, Ibrahim Fuseni, and Solomon Hammon have all secured a place in the semi final of the ongoing African Games. It was Joseph Paula Moa who led in hit seven as he won that race by 20.91 seconds, and Ibrahim Fuseni also won his race, while Solomon Hammon, who ran in hit nine, he finished second. They've all been explaining why they decided to drop their energy, especially in the last 50 meters of the race. It's good. I just, I just have to execute, come up from the cliff and then just relax at the back street. Yeah. And um, just a few years ago, you were at St. Augustine College. I think there's massive responsibility on your shoulders to make your school proud, your family and every single Ghanaian proud, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. As, 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 as you see, that's why I'm here, just to make my country proud. Yeah. Um, what should we expect in the semi-final? Nothing but the best. This is just the key, so we are reserving in it for the, final, the semi-final. And um, you were quite close to finishing, but you jumped through the line. Yeah, I reached so the jogging when I finished the curve. The curve? Yeah. I saw the guy coming, I said, let me just go with him. And I, I just let him go. What should we expect in the semi-final? My best. Just expect my best. I there are three of you in there. It's you, by Seri, there's Joe Paul. Yeah. Um, what do we should be expecting from, from Ghanaians? We are all trying to qualify to the final. Now let's hear from their coach, Elam Aminapo, who has been speaking about the reason why the athletes decided to drop their energy in the races. Well, uh, this is around one, uh, the heat, the most important thing to, is to make it to the semi-final. You know, first three qualified, there's no essence of wasting energy, running all out and burning out and don't have that energy to run in the final. The most important thing, they are all in the semi and then uh, the goal is to qualify to the final. Now this suggests that the conversation has been about that, come on, this is too easy, this is too easy, take it easy. Well, if, if it is easy, that's even the main reason why you don't have to waste your energy because when you win the heat, you don't get medal. When you win the semi-final, you don't get medal. It's the final that's picked for the medal. So they are reserving the energy. That's the most important thing. If you get it easy, it's good that you preserve that energy, that you don't waste it. Then tell me the final one. There have many concerns about the shadow. It's quite compact for these athletes. As coaches, how does this become a challenge and how are you able to psych the boys to be able to get the energy to run again? Yeah, I have been in the, I have coached at the world level. I have not seen a 20 meters hit and semi-final run in the same day before. But this is the situation that we have right now. That is the main reason why they have to preserve energy, run the semi-final and progress to the this. So that's what we are doing as coaches, talk to them to, I mean, hold it. When you know that you are safe, that you are, you are, you are able to go to the, the final day. the semi-final will be happening from 4 p.m. This is our wrap-up sports here on Joy News. Today, I am Muftaw Nabila Abdullah. World News is up next. And that's how we wrap up the bulletin this afternoon. Before we go, though, there's a statement coming from the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, and I'll share with you excerpts of that statement. It will be coming on your screen uh, shortly. And... Right, so the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission is asking the three teacher unions to end the strike and come back to the negotiating table. A meeting scheduled for today with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, we are hearing, did not come on, but there's another one scheduled with the Ministry of Education, hoping that that will resolve the issue. We'll bring you details of all of that in our subsequent bulletins. That's how we wrap up the bulletin this afternoon. Log on to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories to enjoy the rest of our programs.